So we are continuing in the book of Ruth. Uh, this evening we will be in uh, Ruth chapter 3, which I'm titled Ruth's Request. Uh, we looked at uh, chapter 2 last week, started getting into to, to the, uh, the kinsman uh, redeemer, the, the, the goel, the family redeemer that can redeem someone that suffered loss to continue to carry on the family name. So in Ruth chapter 2, verse 23, the very last scripture here, it says, So Ruth worked alongside the woman in Boaz's fields and gathered grain with them until the end of barley harvest. Then she continued working with them through the wheat harvest in the early summer. And all the while, she lived with her mother-in-law. So that's how we ended up uh, chapter 2. So we pick it up in Ruth chapter 3, starting in verse 1. And it says, One day Naomi said to Ruth, My daughter, it's time that I found a permanent home for you, so, so that you will be provided for. Naomi's telling her, No, it's time for you to, to, to find a husband. It's time for you to, to and she says for me to find you. Uh, she's trying to play matchmaker here. But in, in Ruth chapter 1, we know the story in, in, in verse 8 when Naomi decides to go back to Bethlehem. She decides to leave Moab and she's with her daughter in laws, uh, Ruth and, and Oprah. And she tells them to go back home, go back to your families. You know, let God reward you for your kindness towards me and your husbands. And she says this thing she says, May the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. That you'd find another husband. She says, I'm too old. I can't have kids for you to wait for, for, for me to have a son. So she says, why don't you just go back to your family and find the security of another marriage. That you would find someone that you can marry that could take care of you. It says that she kissed him goodbye and they broke down and wept. But he says that Ruth refused to go. That Ruth wanted to stay with her mother Naomi. So here we see how New, Ruth, Naomi's telling Ruth, it's your time. It's your time that to be taken care of. It's your time to be provided for through marriage. And she says, you know what, this is going to be the best for you. Again, in, in chapter 1, she says, I'm too old now. And she's probably thinking to herself, you know, I'm not going to be around much longer. What are you going to do when I'm gone? I think it's time for you to find a husband. So in Ruth chapter 3 and verse 2, it says that Boaz, she's speaking to her, she's still speaking to her. She says, Boaz is a close relative of ours. Boaz is our, our kinsman redeemer. He's our goel. And he's been very kind by letting you gather grain with his young women. He says, tonight... He'll be winnowing barley at the threshing floor. We talked about that last week, what winnowing was. That's how they would separate the grains from the chaff, how they throw it in the air. And it says that he will be in the, in, in, in the, in the, the threshing floor winnowing tonight. Again, Ruth had been working alongside all the women of Boaz in the field. Chapter 1, it says that she started working during barley season, and then it went into the summer and into, into the wheat season. Now we see that they're back into the barley season again. So this shows me that she's probably been working with them for almost close to a year now, that she's been spending some time there with, with Boaz in his field. And in that time, Boaz and Ruth got to know each other. You know, and again, they got to see each other's character. They got to see how, you know, they worked, how they treated people, and how they, you know, were, and again, they weren't a couple. They were not a couple. They just, she just worked in his field, but they were able to see each other, how they were, and they could get to know their character. Again, he probably observed how Ruth worked. After she passed probation, you know how, how it is when people pass probation, you know, they're, they're the model employee until they pass probation. And then it's like, what happened to them? They passed probation. You know, that's what, that's what we always say. So he got to see how she was doing, and then maybe she passed probation and see if she was still being a hard worker. Again, Boaz was able to see firsthand all the reports of her being a good worker, you know, that they were true. And also she was living up to her name, which was called friendship. And again, how she, he was able to see how she continued to take care of her mother-in-law. And Naomi tells Ruth, you know, Boaz has been kind to you. And Ruth was able to see if that continued, that if Boaz was he continuing to be kind to them. You know, that's what we tell couples, you know, if you want to get married, get to know each other. You know, don't come to us and say, hey, I met this guy two weeks ago and we want to get married. You know, I met this girl last weekend and we want to get married, Pastor. You know, get to know each other. Get to know each other. Get some marriage counseling. You know, get to know their character. Make sure they're truly living for God. You know, a lot of people say they're living for God, but they're just doing that to say, you know, so they can find a husband and wife. When you get to know them, spend some time getting to know them, you'll know if they're really serving and living for God. Again, Naomi states that he's their close relative. He was their goel, their kinsman redeemer. He had the right to redeem them and carry on the name of their deceased husband and father-in-law so, so that their name would not be blotted out from Israel. And Ruth could make this request from Boaz. She was able to make this request from Boaz because Boaz could redeem her by marrying her. And, you know, Naomi here is trying to play matchmaker. She says, it's time for me to find you a husband. But really God is really putting all this together. God is orchestrating this whole thing to find her in the field of Boaz. God put that together. God put her there. 
The Bible says that when God joins together, God put them together. It says tonight he's going to be winnowing in the barley, winnowing the barley at the threshing floor. Naomi says this is where Boaz is going to be tonight. Because this was Boaz. Even though he was wealthy and influential, it says that in chapter 2 that he was a wealthy and influential man. But it also says he was a kind man. You can see how he was kind to his workers. But he also worked right alongside his workers. He wasn't out there just dishing out orders. You know, it's like, hey, you do this, you do that. I'm going to go be sitting in the house where there's air conditioning, you know, and you guys just get to work. He wasn't like that. It says that he would be winnowing. He would be out there working right along the workers. He'd be working at night tonight. You know, doing that. He was out there just giving orders, but this man rolled up his sleeves, got his hands dirty, and he worked right alongside his workers. And Naomi knew exactly where he was going to be. She says, tonight he'll be winnowing, winnowing in the threshing floor. She knew exactly where he would be. It's so important as us that we are where we are supposed to be, especially when it comes to couples. We need to be where we are supposed to be. Our spouses need to know exactly where we are because it keeps us from trouble. Got to be accountable to our spouse. And okay, oh, come on, pastor, she don't need, he don't need to know where I'm at. When you say that, I ask this question, what are you hiding? Seriously, what are you hiding when you have to say, why do you always got to know where I'm at? Because I'm your spouse. You want to be accountable because it protects you. Boaz was exactly where he was supposed to be. See, when you're supposed to be where you are with your, when you're supposed to be, there, there shouldn't be any problems. Uh, next month, me and Tina are going to be celebrating 40 years of marriage. I mean, we're going to be celebrating 40 years. And this that I speak about is what we practice. We are always accountable to each other. I mean, I'm going here, I'm going there, and, and we're always pretty much always together. I always, I always say this. You're going to find me with two people. It's going to be either my wife, Tina, or my son, Matt. We're always, you're always going to find me with either one of those two. And that's just how it is with us. And, and, and you know, and, and, and it's worked. You know, accountable, we're always together. I don't, I'm not one of those who always want to hang out with the brothers and go do this and that and join baseball leagues. And I, I'd rather spend time with my wife. I really would, my sons. But some people just love living the single life even though they're married. You know, they're just like, oh, man, I want to live like a single. And then you wonder why there's problems. Seriously, we wonder why there's problems. I see those that have been here for many years that have long-lasting marriages, and I guarantee you they can say the same thing. We're always together, and we're always accountable to each other. I always see Pastor Bernie always posting pictures of him and Sister Elvira, always on dates, always going on dates. And, I mean, that's a blessing. And what it does is it encourages people to see that, especially young people. You know, they, hey, man, look at, look at my pastor. He's there. Him and his wife are always together doing stuff together. And, I, and, I, and there's a lot of couples here that have been here many years. We can say the same thing. And, I, I, and I'm on this point because I, I see so many people that are just like have struggles. And it's like, well, because you want to be over here and over there instead of being with your spouse. Boaz was exactly where he was supposed to be. We look at 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 1. In the spring of the year when the kings normally go out to war, it says, David sent out Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonites' army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. It says, however, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. It says, when the kings went out to battle, David decided to stay home and watch the Dodger game. You guys didn't think I was going to go there. I went there, amen. Okay, okay, come on out. David stayed home, and what happened? is David ended up committing adultery with that Bathsheba. It wasn't moral failure, it was adultery. I always hear that word, moral failure. No, it's adultery. It's almost like you're trying to water it down and make it, oh, it's, oh, it's just that. No, it's adultery. And David committed adultery with Bathsheba, and then it just snowballed for there. Had her husband killed, and everything just snowballed. for Why? Because David was not where he should have been. David should have been in battle with the rest of the kings, but he decided to sit this one out, and it just, it just backfired on him and got himself in a big old mess. Again, Boaz was exactly where he was supposed to be. And Ruth 3.3, now as I tell you, Naomi's talking to Ruth here. Now do as I tell you. She tells her, take a bath, put on perfume, and dress in your nicest clothes. Then go to the threshing floor. He says, but do not let Boaz see you until he has finished eating and drinking. No, Naomi tells her to follow these instructions. 
she tells her to take a bath and put on perfume and dress in your nicest clothes. And everybody laughs, but this is serious because she was in the field day and night, day and night, day and night. And she probably worked up, you know, and I'm not saying this to be funny, but she's probably put, worked up quite an odor there. And what Naomi's doing is she's getting her ready to make, to, for, for Ruth to make her request known to Boaz. She's, t- she's telling her, this is what you're going to do because you're going to make your request to Boaz. And we're going to get into it a little bit. And she didn't want, she doesn't want Boaz to look at Ruth as more than just somebody that works in his fields. You know, because this is going to be the time when Ruth's going to come to him and she's going to make a request to him. And, and she didn't want it to be where, you know, they, you know, they finally really, really, they, I mean, they worked in the field, but they're really going to start laying eyes on each other at this moment. And Ruth, and, and Naomi didn't want this request to be where, you know, Boaz's lasting memory of Ruth coming to him is like, oh, my God, what's that smell? That's not what she wanted. She wanted it to be a moment that Boaz would never forget. She wanted it to be where he would be like, oh, my God, wow, what's going on here? Because she goes, put on some perfume and fragrance and the beauty that would just wow him. Why? Because she wanted Boaz to realize, man, this is a moment I will never forget. The first time I really laid eyes on Ruth. You remember the first time you laid eyes on your spouse? Hopefully you're not saying I'm trying to forget. Amen. (laughs) I hope not. Praise the Lord. My wife's not here tonight. She had two teeth pulled today, but I was, I was going to share this story. I remember the first time we, I seen her. It was at, we grew up in Norwalk. It was at Excelsior High School. It was, I was in 11th grade. And, and so those who know Excelsior High School, Pioneer Boulevard's the main street. Well, that building in the front is the administration building. That's where you, you enter the, to the school. And right there was my locker. My locker was in that building. So it was right after lunch. And I'm in my locker, and I turn around. And Tina's barely getting to school because she usually got to school after lunch. Amen. But... I see her walking down the hallway, and it was like a movie. I'm, I, I kid you not. It was like a movie. I'm like, oh, my God, who is that? And she's just walking towards me, and I'm like, oh, my God, I was, I was in love, amen, right away. <laughs> amen. I kid you not. It was like a movie. And my kids always make fun of me because, yeah, and then she walked by and looked at you. What are you looking at and pushed you in your locker, right? <laughs> and yeah. I was like, oh, she touched me. <laughs> that was the first time I laid eyes on my wife, and I was like, oh, my God, I was like, my God, who is she? And I was in love. And, and then the day she walked down the aisle, I was like, oh my God, my, I was, that was like, I'll never forget that day. Hey, man, my cousin even looked over to me and goes, man, she's beautiful, cuz. And I go, I know she is, you know. This is what Naomi wanted for Ruth, that Boaz would be in awe, like, oh, my God, she's beautiful. Because she's going to make a request to him in a few minutes. So she wanted her to, to, to put on her best. So when Boaz looked at her, he didn't say, oh, my God, what's this money? So, oh, my God, this woman's beautiful. Noemi tells Ruth to go to the threshing floor. But she tells him, don't bother him until after he's done eating. Some guys will bite your head off if you get in the way of their food. Amen. So she said, wait till he's done eating. In Ruth 3, 4, he says, be sure to notice where he lies down. Then, on, then go and cover his feet and lay there. He will tell you what to do. Now, this was not an attempt to seduce Boaz into a sexual act or to entrap him. She didn't tell him to go lay at his feet and then, you know, try to, to get him into a sexual act. No. She said, in, well, in that day, what this was, this was an act of humility but also an act of submission. That those pe- people would lay at the master's feet and they would be ready for a command from the master. That's why Naomi says, he will tell you what to do. She says, just go and cover his feet and just lay there. She didn't say wake him up. She didn't say try to tease him or, 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 or flirt with him. She said just lay there and wait till he tells you what to do. In Ruth 3.5, it says, I will, and Ruth is speaking now. She says, I will do everything you say, she replied. So she went down to the threshing floor that night and followed the instructions of her mother-in-law. This might have been weird to Ruth, but she trusted Naomi. We need to trust God, or we need to trust those, especially our elders, when they try to give us godly wisdom. We really need to trust our elders when they try to bring some experience and godly wisdom to us. And this is what Ruth did. She trusted in the, in the wisdom of her mother-in-law, Naomi. Proverbs 1.8 says, My children, listen when your father corrects you. And it says, Don't neglect your mother's instruction. It's so important that we remember that. We listen to our elders because they have some, and I'm talking about godly wisdom. Proverbs 23.22 
Listen to your father who gave you life and do not despise your mother when she is old. Again, it's telling us to respect and honor our, our, our elders, especially when they're trying to correct us or give us advice. So it says that she did everything Naomi extru- instructed her. She re- did everything that Naomi told her. Naomi told her, this is what I want you to do. I want you to do, you know, take, a, take a bath, put on perfume, your best clothes. I want you to go, wait till he's done eating, then go when he lays down, lay at his feet, and cover his feet and lay there. And it says Naomi did everything, that, I mean, uh, Ruth did everything Naomi uh, instructed her. It was just a sign of respect here. She respected her mother-in-law's opinion, and she did exactly what she said. Isn't it so good when you give instruction or advice to someone, and they follow it? You know, it's just like, you know, you try to give some godly wisdom, godly encouragement, you know, speaking to somebody's life, and they follow the advice that you give them. What's sad is when somebody comes to you, and then you find out they went and sought counsel from you know, five other people until they found something they wanted to hear. To me, it's a sign of disrespect. When they come to you and say, oh, yeah, you know, I really trust your opinion, this and that, okay, and you give them godly wisdom. Then you hear they went and told, asked five other people because they want to find something that was easy for them. Naomi, I mean, Ruth showed her mother-in-law respect by doing exactly what she told her. She didn't go to the other women in the city and say, hey, you know what Naomi t- told me to do? What do you think? No, she did exactly what her mother told her, mother-in-law told her. She respected her. Ruth 3, 7, after Boaz had finished eating and drinking, he was in good spirits. He lay down at the far end of the pile of the grain and went to sleep. Then Ruth came quietly. She came quietly, um, covered his feet, and lay down. What Boaz was doing, he was enjoying the fruits of his labor. He was eating, and he was full and happy. He's probably rubbing his stomach, you know. He's, he's just full of, full of, just full. I was talking to George at the, at the banquet and he's looking at me, and I'm just like, oh, God, oh, God. <laughs> I was like, I eat too much. And that's what Boaz did. He was enjoying life, and he went and laid down. But it says he went and slept on the threshing floor. He didn't go to his house. He didn't go to, to, to anywhere else. It says he laid on the threshing floor. Why? He did this to protect his, his, his grain. Because there, in the day, there would, there would be thieves and robbers that would come and steal the grain when nobody was around. In 1 Samuel 23, 1, it says, One day the news came to David that the Philistines were in Kalah stealing grain from the threshing floor. So this is a common practice from thieves and robbers that they would go and steal the grain from the threshing floor. So this is why Boaz laid at the field. It's like today. You see in the news almost every morning, businesses that are getting ransacked. You know, they're just, people are driving into them and taking stuff or, you know, pulling, pulling the gates off. And, you know, it's almost a common thing nowadays. And, and, and so sad because a lot of businesses, they don't recover and they end up going out of business. So this is what Boaz does. He was laying there in, with his grain on the threshing floor protecting his, his grain. So then Ruth came, Ruth came quietly and covered his feet and laid down. She didn't make a ruckus. She didn't try to wake him up. It says she came humbly and quietly just as her mother-in-law Naomi instructed her. So at about midnight, Boaz woke up and he turned over. He was surprised to find a woman laying at his feet. He says, who are you? He asked. He says, I am your servant, Ruth. She replied. And then she says, spread the corner of your covering over me, for you are my family redeemer. See, Boaz wasn't expecting this. It's, you know, kind of startled him. He's like, well, who are you? What are you doing here? And this is where Ruth identifies herself as her servant, and this is where she makes her request. She says, spread the corner of your covering over me. Let me find security in you. Naomi told her it's time for you to find security in another marriage. And she tells her, let me find security in you. Why? Because you are my family redeemer. She's asking him to marry her. And she can make this request of Boaz because, again, he is their goel. He is their kinsman redeemer. He's their family redeemer. He's the one that's part of the family that he can take her in because she was childless and a widow and marry her that they can have a child and it would continue on the name of, of, her, of her late family. In verse 10, it says, The Lord bless you, my daughter, as Boaz is speaking to her. He says, You're showing even more loyalty now than you did before. You haven't gone after a younger man, whether it be rich or poor. Ruth could have chose anyone. Her mother-in-law told her, go, go back home, find another man, find a security of another marriage. And she could have chose anyone. You know, he, Boaz said, you could have been a, a rich man, a young man. He says, but you're showing your loyalty here more than you did before because you're showing your loyalty to your mother-in-law, but now you're showing your loyalty to your late husband and your late father-in-law. They're wanting to preserve their names. 
that they wouldn't be blotted out. And this is why she made the request to Boaz. And Boaz is able to redeem her because, again, he is a family member. And she chose to do what is right and, 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 and continue the family man and show loyalty to them. You know, because so many people are just so worried about, you know, the outside appearance. They don't look at, you know, what's really on the inside. Ruth 3.11, it says, don't worry about a thing, my daughter. I will do what is necessary. For everyone in town knows you're a virtuous woman. He says, I'm going to do exactly what I have to do. I'm going to do what's right. I'm sure at this point, Boaz is pretty excited. I'm sure he's like, wow, this is, this is great. You know, he's probably like, yes, you know, and didn't show up, but he's probably on the way home. He's probably like so excited. But he says, I'm going to do what is necessary. But he says this, he says, everyone in town knows that you're a virtuous woman. Everyone knows who you are. You've been here working along, everybody. Everybody's getting to know you. You're not a flirt. You're not out here trying to entrap anyone. You have a good reputation. And he calls her a virtuous woman. And in Proverbs 31, I'm going to read this because you can see some of the characteristics of this virtuous woman in, in, in the story here of Ruth. It is who can find a virtuous and capable wife? She is more precious than rubies. Her husband can trust her and she will greatly enrich his life. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She finds wool and flax and busily, busily spins it. She's like, some mer- she's like a merchant ship bringing her food from afar. She gets up before dawn to prepare breakfast for her ho- household and plan the day's work for her servants' girls. She goes in t- to inspect a field and buys it. With her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She is energetic strong and a hard worker. That's what they talked about, Ruth. She makes sure her dealings are profitable. Her lamp burns late into the night. Her hands are busy spinning thread, her fingers twisting fiber. She extends a helping hand to the poor and opens her arms to the needy as she would take care of her mother-in-law. She has no fear of winter for her household, for everyone has warm clothes. She makes her bed spread. She dresses in fine linen and and purple gowns. Her husband is well known in the city gates where he sits with the other civic leaders. She makes belted line garments and sashes to sell them to the merchants. She's clothed with strength and dignity. dignity. She laughs without fear of the future. When she speaks, her words are wise and she gives instructions with kindness. She carefully watches everything in her household and suffers nothing from laziness. Her children stand and bless her, and her husband praises her. There are many virtuous and capable women in the world, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive, and beauty does not last, but a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. This is what Boaz said about Naomi. He goes, goes, not only me, but everybody says that you are a virtuous woman. She had a good character. She was living up to her name. She was taking care of her mother-in-law. She was a hard worker. And now it it was her time to make her request to Boaz. And I'm sure Boaz was excited about it. Because he says, I'm going to do what is right. I'm going to try to make these things right. And in verse uh, 12, he says, but, he goes, after all that, but, while this is true that I'm one of your family redeemers, here comes the bad news, there is another man who is more closely related than I am. He tells you, yes, I'm one of your closest relatives, but there's one other that's closer than me. He says, stay here tonight, and in the morning I will talk to him. If he is willing to redeem you very well, let him marry you. But if he is not willing, then as surely as the Lord lives, I will redeem you myself. He says, now lie down here until morning. Boaz tells her, look, there's someone else that's closer than me. Yes, I'd love to do this, but there's someone else that has the right before me. And Boaz, I wonder if he was already inquiring about Ruth, because he already knew this. He's like, wow, you know, he already knew that there was someone closer. I wonder if he was already making inquisition about her, like, hey, who's, who else is in the family you know, tree here? He already knew that there was someone else that was closer relative, and that person had the right to marry Ruth first and redeem her. But he also had the right to refuse to marry her and Boaz says, if he refuses to, to marry you, then I will. And I think Boaz already had a plan in, in set, in, in, in set, set. 
because he says, oh, don't worry, in the morning, I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to talk to him in the morning. So I think Boaz was already planning something. He already had this in mind. Again, it's important not only get to know the person, but get to know their family also. Because Boaz was already inquiring about the family, who, who, who else was there. Because when you get married, you inherit a whole new family. So it's good to, to know a whole new family, get to know them. But he says, I'm going to go talk to him about this in the morning. So he tells uh, Ruth to just lay here until morning. So Ruth lay at Boaz's feet till the morning. But she got up before it was light enough for people to recognize each, for people to recognize each other. For Bo- Boaz has said, no one must know that a woman has been here at the threshing floor. Then Boaz said to her, bring your cloak and spread it out. Says he measured out six scoops of barley into the cloak and placed it on her back. Then he returned to town. Again, there was nothing immoral that was done here. They didn't do anything immoral. What Ruth Ruth did is she came to the threshing floor to make her her request be known to, to Boaz. She came to make her request to him. She didn't come to, to, to entice him. She didn't come to, 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 to seduce him. She came to make a humble request to Boaz. He tells her that no one must know that you were here. And I think you said that because there's people always looking to find something bad about someone and just so eager to, to find fault with them and, you know, go out and make them look bad without even knowing the facts. You know, they just... You think they thought they saw something, and it's like, hey, you know what? I saw this, and you know what? And they go out and start saying bad things about people without even knowing facts. And this is what Boaz didn't want. He says, go before everybody's up, because I don't want anybody to know that you were here. Because he didn't want no gossip. He didn't want no rumors. Boaz didn't want this. Why? Because it would have, it would have destroyed the credibility of both of them. He doesn't give her an engagement ring, but what he does give her is six scoops of barley, Again, this is his kindness towards Ruth and Naomi. How would you like it if your fiancé came to you or future fiancé came to you and gave you six scoops of barley, you know, and they say, I want to marry you. Anybody like that? No, instead of a, a cage of hearing? <laughs> that one failed. Again, he gave her the six scoops of barley, but again, he says he's taking care of not only Ruth, but his mother-in-law, her mother-in-law, Naomi, also. So when Ruth went back to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked her, what happened, my daughter? She what, what happened? What took place? And, and Ruth told Naomi everything Boaz had done for her. She added, he had given me these six scoops of barley. He said, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. He says, look, he's continuing to show us kindness. And she begins, begins to tell her everything that's taking place, that, you know, there's someone else before Boaz. You know, he's going to take care of everything in the morning. Um, you know, and he also gave us these six scoops of barley for the both of us. So Naomi said to her, just be patient, my daughter, until we hear what happens this man won't rest until he settles things today. She says he's not going to stop. He's not going to give up until everything's settled today. And I really believe that Boaz already had a plan. And we're going to see in chapter 4 how Boaz's plan lays out. But again, she says, be patient, my daughter, until we hear what happens. She says, now we wait, but hopefully we'll find out today. We hate waiting, don't we? We hate waiting. We want to know now, right now. Like some of you are just dying for me to finish, aren't you? Tempted, so tempted to pull out your phone. We hate to wait. I got another about 40 minutes. <laughs> we hate waiting. But sometimes God says, you just need to wait. Just sit and wait. Psalm 27, 13 says, yet I am confident that I will see the Lord's goodness. We are confident that we will see God's goodness. We've got to be confident that we'll see God's goodness. It says, while I am here in the land of the living. He says, waiting patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. Sometimes God will ask us to wait. And we wait patiently, but we do it courageously because we know that we will see the goodness of God. And in Psalm 130, verse 5, he says, I wait for the Lord. Who hold, I'm sorry, let me say it again. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits And in his world, I put my hope. Again, waiting on the Lord and putting our hope in him while we wait. I wait for the Lord more than a watchman in the morning. More than a watchman wait, I wait for the Lord. Again, sometimes God asks us to wait. And this is exactly what Naomi told Ruth. Now, dear daughter, let's just sit here and wait patiently. 
And, we, we, and she's saying, hopefully we hear this news by tonight because he's going to work hard on that. And with that, I'll say, to be continued. Next week, we'll pick up chapter 4. And that's chapter 3 tonight, amen. So we'll pick it up in chapter 4. We'll see Ruth's reward next week. And we'll get into all that, that I talked about in Boaz's plan. So why don't we just thank God tonight? Let's just give him praise tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Why don't we bow our heads tonight?